Greetings. The Fulbright Association is pleased to welcome all our attendees today for this Fulbright Forum entitled Looking Back, Going Forward, Dementia Care, COVID-19 in India. The Fulbright Association extends the Fulbright International Exchange into a lifelong experience for U.S. alumni. We connect alumni and friends of the Fulbright program through lifelong learning, collaborative networking, and service projects at home and abroad. Through our 54 local chapters, the Fulbright Association hosts more than 230 regional and national programs each year for visiting Fulbrighters and alumni throughout the United States. This year's programming is particularly special since it's the 75th anniversary of the Fulbright program. Focused on cross-cultural issues, the Fulbright Forum series features extraordinary speakers from around the world. Now I'll hand it over to Nils for today's forum. Hello, th thank you, Munir. Uh, Thank you to the, the Fulbright Association. Uh, thank you to Alzheimer's Disease International, uh, Paula uh, Barbarino, uh, who is with us. Thank you to Peter Braun uh, from the, Uni the, the University of Southern California, Merle Nair, and uh, uh, as well as Mira Patabirman, although she cannot be with us in person. Uh, this is a really special opportunity for all of us. We've been working together since uh, about, well, uh, Merle and I have been working together since 2015, which led to my first uh, Fulbright in uh, 2016 in, in India. And since then, I've continued working with Peter and uh, Mira and Paula together to do some really interesting work around dementia care in India and other places. So uh, what we're trying to do today is to share with you uh, the work that we've done and what is special about dementia care in the international context. And also what I find very interesting about this panel is that we're going to have an opportunity to discuss how COVID has had an effect on this cohort. Uh, the persons with dementia, their family members and caregivers have been affected uh, immensely by COVID and uh, personally, I do not have uh, great insight into what has happened during that time, but I am very uh, much looking forward to hear from, from Mira and particularly Paola because they, they are, they are uh, internationally recognized experts in this field. And uh, Peter has worked for worked for over 20 years in dementia care for the Alzheimer's Association of Southern California. So uh, I am going uh, before I start my presentation. I just want to say to thank you to everyone who is here. And uh, if you would like to ask a question uh, to any of the panel members or to the panel in general, please uh, address it to the, the chat, uh, which is at the bottom of the Zoom webinar. And uh, so after uh, we, we go through our panel, uh, we'll have a brief discussion amongst the panelists, after which we will uh, we will open it for 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 questions from from uh, the the, uh, the uh, people who uh, who are attending. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, okay, and I need to move. <laughs> Sorry. A little bit. Uh, uh, okay, I think I have it now. Okay. And
Okay, this should be it. Okay, so this is our forum, Fulbright Forum for two, November 2nd, and this is go, looking back going forward, Dementia Care and India. And I've in, already introduced to you everybody who is on our panel, so uh, welcome everybody. So to introduce, your, introduce you to me, uh, my name is Nils de Molven Otterloo. I'm a doctor of social work. My background is rather interesting from uh, the social work standpoint. Uh, I began uh, my, my life uh, as a plan to, to be a musician and I went to Berklee College of Music. And uh, I came to Los Angeles in 2002 to make it in the music industry, which changed into me doing uh, after-school music programs for at-risk youth uh, at LAUSD, which led to me meeting my wife, who is a social worker, and uh, I eventually got my MSW from USC, where I met uh, where I met uh, Murley and Peter, although I met Peter at the end of my, my studies. So what was very interesting to me uh, in music and social work was that I began uh, doing work in, in hospice care. And I discovered that you could use music very effectively as an, as a intervention to improve the care of persons with 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 dementia, um, and uh, so I was doing this work, and I I, I shared it with with Murley, and he said, "Oh, you should get a Fulbright." And I I said, "Well, you know, this was uh, uh, 2015. I was uh, 42 at the time, and I thought that that was." Uh, a rather interesting suggestion, but it, it wasn't really uh, uh, likely. But I wound up uh, applying and uh, was accepted for it, and I, I got my first uh, Fulbright Nehru Academic and Professionalism Scholarship uh, in 2016 to do uh, research on musical reminiscence therapy and dementia care. Uh, I performed this work in the state of Kerala, which you'll learn a little bit more about from, uh, from Murley. Um, he uh, grew up in, in, uh, in Kerala, and so he has, he has a lot of in, uh, interesting background in that. But to uh, speak a little bit uh, about why uh, social work and dementia care uh, fit well with one another. I, I, what I have come to understand uh, about dementia is that a lot of people, they either, uh, to a greater, greater degree, ignore it or they don't have a, a very deep understanding of, of what it is, what it, what it, what causes it and what, what, what a good solution for it would be. So over the last 30 to 40 years, there have been many uh, medications and there's a lot of money that's uh, in, in pharma that has been trying to come up with uh, effective solutions for, for, for dementia, dementia. But, you know, there are many kinds of dementia. I mean, there are at least four different types of dementia and Alzheimer's is just one of them. And it became pretty clear to me that, uh, that uh, pharmacological solutions were not the, the proper, uh, proper answer. Oh, my, my screen isn't working. Okay. Um, so in, in the West, uh, Alzheimer's and dementia has been relatively common for over 60 to 100 years, and that's largely because uh, persons with dementia are diagnosed after age 60 or more likely after age 80. And in a country like India, uh, as in most uh, 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 low income or uh, uh, countries, the access to 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 uh, 
medical care, uh, uh, proper diet, and uh, many factors have have led to uh, most persons uh, living to age 50 at most. And that changed about 40 years ago in India, where, where the access uh, became became much more available, and th that led to people living a much much longer. So, in the West, building dementia infrastructure and developing uh, associations like the Alzheimer's Association and pro professional meetings and training uh, was more available. And in 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 countries like India, it has taken. Uh, the, the the benefit of uh, of uh, NGOs such as Alzheimer's Disease International to create a a a uh, a, a uh, I'm trying to think of basically a, uh, a a group so that all the all the countries can get together and and discuss what 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 works and what doesn't work. Uh, developing advocacy, establishing associations, get, getting data, which is, especially in countries like India, the data that you need to uh, make the argument that uh, to get more money or more resources for dementia, it's just, it's just not, it's not public, it's not uh, published to the degree that it, it needs to be. And so, therefore, you're not able to develop these professional standards uh, except through uh, organizations like ADI and ARDSI. Uh, so, a lot of what we have done in our in our work has been to develop uh, to, to discuss policies and dementia plans, uh, standards, legal uh, framework, and public health perspectives and uh, the final finalization finalization of this is hopefully to bring more normalization and acceptance of dementia as a disability um, in India this is obviously I've already discussed it it's it's the the increased prevalence by age which changed around uh, in in the 80s I suppose um, the the founder of Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's and related diseases Society of India uh, dr. Jacob Roy he passed away uh, uh, maybe two years ago but the reason why he became uh, involved with dementia was that his father, who was a, a Christian uh, minister, he developed early onset dementia while he was still in his 20s and he was working as a doctor. And so he, that led him to uh, begin forming ARDSI, which started as a relatively small organization in the state of Kerala. And now it, it, it is all over over India, and uh, it is really a fantastic uh, thing that has happened. Um, India has so many, so many issues that, from a social work standpoint, I mean, you you, you could not even begin to have uh, have an idea of where where to, where to start. But I I have to say that when I arrived in India in 2016. I was very impressed with artsy and and the degree to which they were were doing a lot of great work with a with a with a poor hand as it were and as soon as I got back um from from India the first thing I I could think was like how do I get back how can I do something to to work with artsy and with ADI, and uh, that's essentially what we're going to be discussing uh, with Peter, Paula, and uh, and and um, 
Mira's uh, presentation. We don't seem to have one of our uh, present present presenters, Murley, but I, I can possibly uh, uh, share his part of the 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 presentation. So no, he's he's on he's online. No. He is, uh, but uh, okay. Well, so Murley. Uh, uh, Murley Nair is was my professor at USC, and uh, he is a very fascinating person. And he grew up in Kerala, and he's hopefully going to be able to give us a little bit of insight, particularly because he has done uh, research on uh, on on uh, geriatric uh, persons in in India. So uh, I'll, I'll see if I can pass it to him. Early, I think you're muted. You'll have to unmute yourself. Yeah, you're, you're still muted. Well, as you can see, this is India. And uh, at the very bottom of India is a very small country, uh, state called Kerala. Kerala is a beautiful part of India. I very, I highly recommend you go. If you have a chance to go to India, do not skip Kerala. It is a must, must uh, uh, place to go. It's got the most beautiful beaches. It has... Uh, beautiful uh, boundary waters. It has this area called the Spice Mountains that uh, uh, it, it is really incredible. So uh, this is um, this here. Oops, sorry. Oh, can I go back? Oh yes, here we go. So this is uh, a smaller uh, map of, of, of Kerala and uh, a picture of uh, it's from the area called Munar, which is a very beautiful area. I would love to hear from Murley because this is really his, uh, his home. Um, but this is a picture of some of the work that I was doing uh, with Artsy in, in, uh, in Kerala at one of their... their uh, their dementia care homes. Hey, hey Merle. Can you hear, me? Can you hear yeah. me now? Now we can. You can hear me? Yes. Oh, I apologize. I, let me just take 10 minutes and I have some audio <laughs> challenges. I am up in the mountain area of California. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. Merle, uh, Merle, we'll, we'll, when you're, you're ready, we'll, we'll add you later. I'm going to, to uh, go to, uh, to Mira and hear, we'll hear her uh, presentation and then, then we'll, you, you, why don't you just text me and let me know when you're ready, okay? No, now I am ready now. Let me, let me ask Mira to wait 10 minutes. Let me just okay. finish my side. Okay. okay. Okay, since you can hear me, oh, Good morning. I am apologize for my audio uh, confusion. And I was born in uh, Spice Mountain area where Nil has been doing field studies and brought up in the United States. I spent almost 60, 60 years in the United States, but we still have traditions and values. And when we are growing up, our uh, parents and our grandparents, they instill in us our traditional values. And Unfortunately, what is happening now is things like very basic things like memorization, socialization, lifestyle, it is drastically changed. And we use a concept called decolonization. And because of the media and because of the dietary habits and the way we are watching television, the, the, the old lifestyle already changed. For example, when we were young, we were told to memorize uh, numbers and, uh, and, and all kinds of poems and all that things. And you all know the new evidence-based study shows that whatever you memorize in the first five years of your life, that has a positive effect on your brain function as such, you know? And also we, 
even the elder people, I, I do some field studies uh, among the Spice Mountain area, people who are 100 plus years old who are uh, very healthy. And I look for uh, these centenarians and super centenarians, very minimally utilize modern medicine. And again, you know, uh, their uh, memory power is amazing. They could tell the name and the date of birth of their great, great, great grandchildren and their names. And, and they could very well remember, you know. And again, people like us need to go back and look at the whole concept of traditions and values. Definitely, we have modern medicine available for all the answers. For 14 years, I took people like Nils, who were in the graduate program, to Kerala for a study abroad program. It was a six weeks program. And I let them stay with the local families. You know, it was a participant observation uh, kind of a study we did. And it is amazing, you know, what they were able to accumulate as a new knowledge. And I still have the website of they did a daily uh, their uh, uh, reflections in the form of uh, web up, uh, updates, you know. So I'll be glad to give you the link. And also I have a link for my two field studies among the centenarians and super centenarians. My own name is the website, murilinayar.com. Perhaps you may want to take a look at that one. Uh, in short, what I request to you is uh, instead of negating the local customs and values, please, please try to explore more, anything we can learn. And for example, uh, we have thousands of years of uh, traditional medicine like Ayurveda, naturopathy, and somewhere other in uh, slowly trickling down into our country here. But I think there are something very positive about, especially when you're looking at this whole concept of memorization. And please try to uh, look at you know, what we can learn from them instead of we go and tell them this is good for you. I know they have limited resources and unlimited needs, but that is happening lately in our uh, evidence-based studies. You know? So I wish you all all the best. Uh, back to Nils, thank you. Thank you, Murali. And uh, yes, I, I think you and I have talked a great deal about the the, the significant difference between evidence-based versus non-evidence-based and how when it comes to especially care in, in this, in this uh, field, uh, more attention should be paid to non-evidence-based care because, I mean, like I said earlier, the pharmacological uh, resources are limited. Anyway, I'm going to move on to, uh, this is a video uh, from, from, uh, from the chairperson for Alzheimer's and Related Diseases Society of India, uh, Mira Patabiraman. Namaste, greetings from India. My thanks to Niels and the Fulbright Forum for giving me this opportunity to talk about RC, our activities, the impact of COVID and the way forward. It would have been my pleasure to join you live, but because this happens in the middle of the night for me, I'm sending you my recorded video. India is the second most populous country in the world. The population of our elderly alone is over 100 million and it is estimated that we have about 5.9 million persons with dementia. But what is more alarming is that only 10% of the cases get a diagnosis, and that too happens in the advanced stage of the disease. The Alzheimer's and Related Disorders Society of India was established in 1992. We are India's largest working group to create a dementia-friendly society. As a registered nonprofit organization, we have 22 chapters across India. Our objectives are to improve public awareness about dementia, to promote prevention, to improve care, have early diagnosis and intervention, impart training to caregivers, medical professionals, and family members so that the quality of care is overall improved. 
and to advocate for a national policy and plan for dementia. And finally, to engage in socioeconomic, therapeutic, and clinical research on dementia. We have been actively engaged in a host of activities for over 25 years to meet our objectives. Awareness about dementia is much better now than it was years ago by the work done through our chapters and the national office. Still, we have a long way to go before the rural population where the bulk of our people live are fully sensitized. A lot has been done to improve awareness among the medical professionals and health and community workers. Along with awareness, we are also doing a lot of work to eradicate stigma, as this is one of the primary reasons why persons do not go to see a psychiatrist and they are reluctant to come out and accept that someone in the family has dementia. Training of both professional as well as family caregivers is one of our primary functions. We established the National Training Center in Trivandrum a couple of years back. ARTC was also part of the Dementia Care Skills Training Program initiated by the Asia-Pacific Regional Office of ADI to meet the demands of having a uniform training program that is culturally appropriate for our region. Now, we have gone a step forward. We are in the process of developing India-specific training programs, and a team of experts have been constituted to develop modules of care suitable for us. The pandemic has taught us the advantage of online training, and we have been successfully conducting virtual training for both family and professional caregivers for the past few months, ever since the lockdowns were imposed. It also means that persons from different parts of India can take part and gain from the online training. We are also planning to get associated with a couple of universities so that we get accreditation for our training programs. This is one area where Niels will be able to work closely with ARTC when it comes to India on his Fulbright scholarship as he will be working with a university in Kerala and his expertise and technology will help us in the preparation of videos and PowerPoint presentations. Advocacy is another significant area we have put in a lot of work over the last few years. We published the Dementia India Report in 2010, and this was a starting point of our advocacy measures. Eight important recommendations were made, calling on the government to recognize dementia as a public health priority, improve diagnostic facilities and skills, start more care facilities for persons with dementia, and provide adequate support for caregivers. We have a national office in Delhi, and this liaison office does all the public policy advocacy with the various ministries of the government, and it also does networking with like-minded associations. WHO's Global Action Plan on Dementia, Call for Action, gave an impetus to our advocacy measures. Based on the Global Action Plan, we prepared the Dementia India Strategy Report leading to a country plan. Recommendations have been made and what needs to be done in the seven areas suggested by WHO and the resources to be allotted for these seven areas have also been earmarked in our strategy report. We had the pleasure of having Paula with us at the National Conference in Bangalore when the report was handed over to the Health Minister, Mr. J.P. Nadda. Later, when the new Health Minister, Dr. Harshwadhan, took charge, my colleagues and I met him in Delhi and we handed over the report along with a request for a national plan. We have been in constant touch with officials in the ministry so that to give an impetus to our I, I apologize for that. Apparently I did that. Let me see if I can get it back. Oh boy. Let me see if I can do this. Otherwise, I'll... Uh, let's say it's there. To give an impetus to our advocacy measures. And in fact, we've been sending requests for setting up memory clinics in various states under a project called the Program Implementation Plan. 
In India, health is a state subject. So proposals for setting up the memory clinics were sent to the mission directors in 15 states with a request to send them to our federal or the central government. And fortunately for us, the whole process got stalled because of the pandemic. But now the situation has been improving and we are back with our advocacy measures. Here, I would like to acknowledge the support from ADI and from Niels and Peter with our plans for the national plan, as well as the way forward to get the central government as well as state governments to launch dementia specific plans. The impact of the pandemic and the subsequent lockdowns have been huge, not only on our economy, but has severely affected persons with dementia and their families. Persons with dementia are more vulnerable to the complications of the virus because of their comorbid conditions. And suddenly found they had no access to doctors or social workers, and even the regular help were no longer available. We at Artsy continue to provide support to the families through phone calls, video calls, and technology came to our rescue. Through telemedicine, some persons were able to get medical treatment for related ailments and also for follow-up. Our full-time residential care centers have taken adequate precaution and have been functioning throughout the pandemic. In fact, staff orientation on precautions, patient safety, risk assessment, and emergency handling were conducted regularly. Our daycare services had to be suspended due to complete lockdown. However, the clients were contacted frequently by the staff and they were provided guidance over the phone, video conferencing, social media messages, and off-site distance monitoring. Caregiver support meetings, as well as one-to-one -one family counseling to address behavioral problems and reduce caregiver stress because this was a big spurt in that during the lockdown. So we have been helping them throughout the lockdown and the pandemic. Finally, financially too, we were challenged. Income from the training center and the daycare centers suddenly stopped. At the same time, we did not let go of our stock. In fact, we had to continue paying rent for the premises which we were not utilizing. On the whole, it was a very challenging for our organization and for the people we were supporting. We are thankful that our friends at ADI and Peter and Nails were in constant touch through Zoom calls, sharing our concerns, and keeping us motivated by saying that this too shall pass, which in fact has proved true. We are now back to supporting persons with dementia and their families through our helplines, counseling, home visits, and enabling treatment through referrals. We are also doing training, virtual training, and our centers are functioning. We are now re-energized and strengthened to do more in the times to come. Thank you for your patient listening. Yes, just to uh, add a couple comments of, off of uh, Mira's statements, uh, how much has changed in the last uh, year and how much fortune we've had because of the virtual platforms in order to communicate. I mean, here we are on Zoom having this forum, but uh, I did my uh, doctorate of social work on a virtual platform at, at the University of, of uh, Southern California, and uh, now it's just everywhere. And then I will also say that uh, Mira makes a very very, probably the most important point when she talks about the ec economic effects of, uh, of the COVID on a country like, like India. When I was there in 2016, there was a massive uh, demonetization of, uh, of the rupee. And the way that effect affected my friends and colleagues and the the state of Kerala where I was was just in, incredible to see. I mean, if something like that had happened in America, I cannot even imagine what what how Americans would respond to that. 
Okay, so now I would like to pass on to my friend Peter. Peter was never a professor of mine, but has become probably uh, one of my most uh, uh, important uh, 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 colleagues because he is he, he he knows so much about leadership and about uh, the all the aspects of uh, from the smallest to the biggest scale of uh, developing a a project uh, in the realm of social work. So he's going to share with you what we were a what we've been doing since 2017. Uh, hold on a second. Let me get his. There we go. Nils, thank you for your kind words. Yes, it has been quite a journey these last six years, I believe. Um, namaste. Um, I, I want to thank Mara, who is uh, uh, with us <clears throat> virtually um, uh, for her leadership of Artsy, the Alzheimer's Disease and Related Disorders Society of India, and for the impressive work of her organization to serve those living with dementia and their families in India. <clears throat> in my professional role as president and CEO of the Alzheimer's Association in Los Angeles and later Southern California, I attended the ADI, Alzheimer's Disease International Conference in Kerala, of which uh, my friend and colleague Morley has spoken, uh, in Kerala, India, over 20 years ago, I was, I was deeply moved and impressed by the work of the then new organization and its leadership. I remained in contact with the leaders over the years and reconnected in recent years due to the commitment and engagement of Nils and of course the, the fine uh, 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 professional and lay leadership of ADI. We built a prototype project. We, uh, as you can see, our partnership, uh, Alzheimer's Disease and Related Disorders Society of India, Alzheimer's Disease International, and the University of Southern California. Um, we proposed a prototype project to expand the capacity of Artsy and its services through a robust collaboration. It included, as I noted, the society, Artsy, both its lay and professional leadership, Alzheimer's Disease International professional staff, the University of Southern, and the University of Southern California faculty and graduates, and myself. <laughs> this project, as you can see, focused on capacity building in India and the potential for replication with other ADI associations around the globe. Our team proposed that this project over a three-year period would expand resources and intervention strategies for care with the following three goals. Uh, so you can see under intervention, to expand Artsy's national office, to provide funding to chapters and increase their capacity and develop a national training center in the state of Kerala. Um, as, I, as I noted, our team was comprised of uh, Mira Patabiraman, who you've met uh, virtually, board chair of Artsy, um, Ramasamy Narendar, Executive Director of Artsy. Uh, uh, Nils, who you have met. Uh, Nikki Bayless, Executive Officer for ADI and myself. In 2017, following Nils' uh, return from his full, first Fulbright in India, um, this team began to meet uh, throughout the year, bi-monthly uh, and sometimes quarterly, to develop the goals for our plan, 
programmatic priorities, a three-year timeline, and proposed outcomes. Our discussions acknowledge the community assets and the strengths of Artsy built over 20 years, as Mira has discussed. Um, uh, acknowledging those strengths and building on those strengths. Given Artsy's uh, impressive leadership, both, both lay, uh, both volunteer and professional, our collaboration, our team, um, our vision was to increase both the organization's financial stability and its programs and services. In addition, our partnership included work to, include, to increase RC's capacity to cultivate and engage potential donors to support the plan, whether it be individual donors, corporations, foundations, or the government. Those Zoom meetings seem so long ago in 2017 resulted in a three-year proposed pilot plan for capacity building and sustainability, as well as organizational development, with a $100,000 proposal to a foundation that had expressed interest in our work. The general goals, as listed above, included uh, specific actions to impact the work of the organization. Number one, as you can see, expand the national office, provide administrative support and a communication staff, and a communication staff um, to enable the executive director to add government affairs to his portfolio. In expanding the national office, um, funds were proposed to be allocated to chapters to increase their own capacity in service delivery. So first, as I said, expanding the national office with those goals. Secondly, create a government relations program, which Mira spoke to. Um, continue the work of a national dementia plan with the health ministry. Secondly, to present priorities for programmatic expansion, and thirdly, present a proposal for chapter expansion, uh, i.e. Uh, funding from the health ministry through RC to chapters throughout the country. And then thirdly, de uh, develop a national training center in the state of Kerala with the goal of a train the trainers program for healthcare professionals and also for caregivers to become trainers. In addition to the National Training Center, a goal was a pilot project with multiple sites for what we termed through ADI, dementia-friendly communities through state chapters of Artsy. So as you can see from planning to practice, this collaboration resulted in these um, four, four programs. This three-year pilot program partnership had what I term SMART outcomes, S-M-A-R-T, which is not on my slide, but you can note that they were S specific, M measurable, A achievable, R realistic, and T timely. The impressive work in all three areas I've discussed, of course, was impacted in a profound fashion by the, co by the COVID pandemic. Like everywhere else in the world, and for all of you, um, uh, in this program today, uh, we've all been impacted. And more specifically through ADI and its 
member associations, COVID-19 impacted artsy, its caregivers and families, those living with dementia, as well as partners, both public and private. But as, but as Mira said, um, we had built a team supporting one another and, and stayed in touch and worked together. This collaboration has remained strong and we have been working on new initiatives to support Artsy during this challenging time. It is our hope on, on behalf of our, of our team that this collaboration can be a model for replication, not just in India, but as our next speaker will discuss for other Alzheimer's associations around the globe. Focusing on, as is the heading on this last screen, moving from a, a planning process leading to organizational expansion. Finally, and my, and my final words on this slide, it is the spirit of collaboration and support during these past four years, four years, learning from one another and supporting one another that continues to carry us as we work towards a world without Alzheimer's. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I, uh, I very much uh, am, am in tune with your last statement. I, I often um, don't appreciate the degree to which, I mean, I think everything we have done has been so organic in, you know, I mean, it's been four years, but it's just kind of, well, this happened and then that happened. And, you know, here we are, we're still all together. We're all still working on the same project. And it's, it's been fantastic for me. And uh, it's been wonderful to meet everybody, uh, not only on this panel, but uh, in, uh, in, at the Fulbright Association. And I also forgot to mention the U.S. India Educational Foundation, which is responsible for the Fulbright program in India. I, so I, I apologize for not bringing that up. But the next speaker is Paola Barbarino, and uh, I'm very excited to hear what she has to say because she is the hub of uh, over a hundred uh, Alzheimer's associations throughout uh, uh, the globe. And uh, so her perspective uh, on this issue should be uh, very interesting. So please, uh, Paula, please uh, take it away. Thank you very much, Niels. Um, I'm delighted to meet everybody. Thank you for staying on. I am Paola. I'm based in London, where it's quite uh, late now. It's very much night. Um, and it's been really interesting to hear all of this presentation. ADI has been mentioned so many times. I thought probably a good idea would be as first slides to give you some idea of what do we do at ADI and why it is relevant to this conversation. So ADI was established in 1984, and it's an umbrella organization of Alzheimer's and dementia association around the world. The founder members were the Alzheimer's Association in the States, the UK Alzheimer's Society, the Canada Alzheimer's Society, and the Australian Alzheimer's Society. These organizations at the time were starting to organize themselves, and they were in a very much in a mind of collaboration. They wanted, this is a word that Peter has mentioned, that Niels has mentioned. Collaboration really was the game, name of the game, solidarity also. So the idea was for organizations that were a little bit further ahead to help those that were very much behind and where stigma was really weighing them down. And plus um, also help organization create um, some civil society movement in countries. But the overarching aim was for ADI to become uh, the INGO that would represent dementia and Alzheimer's at the WHO, at the UN, at OECD level. And that is what we do now. We represent the voice of everybody that deals with dementia and Alzheimer's at these multilateral levels. But ADI is not just about that. It's very much a family. It's very much focused on solidarity and collaboration. 
And in that spirit, we started working on World Alzheimer's Month about 10 years ago. Uh, this year, we had millions and millions of people joining the movement of World Alzheimer's Month. And there's always the more the merrier. So we, we love this kind of fora because it opens up the mind and it gets more people to participate. And we also published the World Alzheimer's Report. The World Alzheimer's Report is a very important publication, possibly the most important in the field of dementia and Alzheimer's, every year dedicated to a different topic. But critically, the first year it was dedicated to the figures, the incidence and prevalence of dementia globally. And it's from these figures that now we can say there are X amount of million people in America or in India or in the UK. So it's an extremely important publication, which this year was devoted to diagnostics. Next slide, please. So our vision is that prevention, care, and inclusion can happen today because the cure may arrive tomorrow, but this is not an excuse for us not to do anything, not to make people feel cared and loved and increase and better the quality of life because it can be done. It's a misnomer. It's a myth that it cannot be done. Even if there isn't a cure, the care can really make a very big difference for people's life. So this slide tells you about our strategy. So as you can see at the bottom of the first triangle, US, UK, Canada, Australia funded ADI. For the first phase that lasted about 20 years, ADI built a network of about 40 member states. We can only have one member per nation. And then we applied to become official state actors at WHO UN. We did that. And then we worked for the last 10 years in lobbying effectively, advocating to the UN and to the WHO to have a standalone global dementia action plan, which we did obtain incredibly in 2017. However, from then our strategy changed because once we had the plan, the great challenge was, yes, all nation states at WHO signed this plan, which includes seven areas. I'm not gonna get into that. Um, and basically, it's a, it's a roadmap to how can we get to better dementia care and research across the world. But our worry is that it's very easy to sign a piece of paper, but then how easy it is to actually implement it. So we have done then a completely different strategy. We have increased our multilateral presence at the G7, G20, and any possible global and regional body we can find. And also, we've been working a lot more individually with governments about strengthening the National Dementia Action Plan or identifying in the healthcare system what are the possible cost savings measures, what are the possible attractive elements that will make a government do something better for dementia. As you can imagine, this is a massive piece of work, very granular, and we work with all of our members in achieving that, including India. And effectively, this project that Niels and Peter have been behind is the, the one of these very important projects. It's about uh, catalyzing, it's about uh, focusing the attention of the Indian government on the fact that they do have a lot of people and they do need to take action. And most lately, and this is the little word symbol, we have been looking at becoming more public oriented because effectively ADI has always been a B2B kind of organization. We speak to the people in the field, we're very famous in the field, but people didn't really understand what we were doing in terms of awareness raising. Since 2019, we have been a lot more uh, public facing and a lot more explicit in inviting the world to unite in an awareness raising mechanism that then may help us putting pressure on governments to create change that will benefit people living with dementia and their families. Next slide, Neil, thanks. So um, Niels told me to tell you something also about the global impact. Just briefly, every three seconds, somebody in the world develops dementia. The total estimated annual worldwide cost is 1.3 trillion, and we estimate that that will raise to 2.8 trillion dollars by 2030. The current number of people living with dementia globally is 55 million, and is projected to raise to 139 by 2050. Next slide, please. Now, um, Niels asked me to focus on, on COVID. So as Mira was mentioning earlier, we were in an incredibly privileged position in ADI because we were working a lot with China very early on. We were very much plugged into what was happening in COVID in Asia. So we were very fast off the block in providing our members with help. So from March 2020, we started publishing. From April 2020, we started having webinars and we have tried to bring all the, the, the world together, but also in um, uh, getting good examples of practice. The one on the right you see 
is when our members in Brazil in June 2020, they invented effectively these curtains, these plastic curtains that were enabling people going to care home to hug each other because up until then it'd been impossible. This made a massive difference. The example on the left is a gentleman in Australia that recreated for his mother that had this routine every morning, a virtual uh, supermarket in his home in the hope that the mother wouldn't disrupt her routine. Another amazing example for which we haven't got an image, but <clears throat> is how Taiwan and France spearheaded this movement to prevent governments from finding people with dementia that were wandering in the street or not social distancing, which was happening both in France and Taiwan. Thanks to that intervention, uh, people in those countries stopped being fined, but also it was an inspiration for a lot of our other members. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, thank you. But COVID-19, uh, let's not make mistakes, has disproportionately affected people with dementia. First of all, um, uh, there are two issues that are not even on this slide. Uh, we estimated last year from data published in higher income country that 25 to 45% of all people who died with COVID-19 died with dementia. So this is a first sobering thought. The second sobering thought, and we've published in, uh, about this in the Wall Street Journal and in the Financial Times recently, we have a big problem because COVID-19 and cognitive deterioration seem to have a connection. And we are seeing increased amount of cognitive deterioration in people that have had COVID-19. So these are two big causes of concern. But the other one, obviously, are mental health issues. And you will have talked about that and heard about that. There's been a huge amount of problems still uh, in both in the carer camp and into the people living with dementia. So the absence of socialization and also of social care and support has wrecked havoc. People that could live a relatively independent life are now finding themselves with huge uh, problems and increased mental health issues and cognitive deterioration. We saw issues of stigma and discrimination in triage. Um, a lot of countries ask their doctors to uh, not put on uh, ventilation people living with dementia that presented themselves at the hospital. This was terrible, massive infringement of human rights. And as you can imagine, we wrote massively about that. And there have been, of course, a lot of uh, problems around the complication related to NCDs, as I'm sure you have read. Um, and then we've had problems with delayed diagnosis. Uh, we've had massive challenges with post-transition support. And of course, also an interruption of clinical trials and to an extent, research. Next slide, please. And we did a huge amount of responses from publishing very early on on dementia care during COVID-19 um, to publishing uh, to and writing to governments around the issues of human rights uh, abuse that I was describing earlier, and also alerting governments about what was happening in other countries. So what happened in Italy and in Spain could have inspired the other European country to avoid the same mistakes. But despite us ra raising the alarm, quite a lot of nations made exactly the same mistake. Uh, also in North America, I mean, Canada has published the figures about that, which are very sobering. Next slide, please. Um, we also published a number of tips about what to do practically, and this had huge uh, distribution. We went from having, I don't know, hundreds of people that would follow our webinars to having thousands of people in a very short period of time. And we created a number of assets in a number of languages. We represent people that operate in hundreds of different languages. And we also ask members to uh, share their resources so that more people, not just our members, could access all these assets. Next slide, please. Um, we started a, a huge series of webinars that have been incredibly uh, popular in which, so we did two series of webinars. One was uh, open to the public at large, and one was open only to our members, and it was aimed at creating a support mechanism for people to be able to share the most awful and difficult stories. The public webinars focused on um, advice, support, uh, science around what was happening with COVID-19. Next slide, please. And we were also very, very active in COVAX. I've been sitting on the COVAX meeting since June 2020. 
and I uh, and the team and all of our members have been therefore uh, very cognizant of what was happening in the vaccination have been instrumental in uh, promoting um, early vaccination for vulnerable adults and especially for distribution of vaccination to lower and middle income countries so that we can obtain global coverage of vaccination. So we've been working on that very much from the beginning with uh, WHO and WHO has provided advice to all of our members. Uh, next slide, please. Um, a little word about World Alzheimer's Month in 2021. Uh, our theme was No Dementia, No Alzheimer's. The World Alzheimer's Report was on diagnostics. And this is just a tiny, tiny picture. Uh, we have had 111 countries involved. And this is not public yet, but we've had over 45 million interactions on uh, this theme alone. So it has been a massive resounding success. This grew from 20 million last year. So we are seeing an escalation of interest and focus on World Alzheimer's Month. We hope next year Fulbright may be able to do some uh, social media around that. That would be lovely. We'll count on Neil to remind you all. Next slide, please. And that is me, and I thank you very much for your patience. I hope you've learned a little bit more about what ADI is and what we are trying to achieve. Thank you, Niels. Thank you very much, Paola. Thank you, everyone, uh, for sharing your insights. I uh, open it up uh, for anybody who would like to uh, 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 get involved with the Q&A or uh, chat and uh, they can ask any panel member a question and if any of the panel members would like to ask questions about each each other's presentation that's fine too. Um, uh, there was one thing uh, uh, from pa Paula's presentation and I'm trying to recall it because uh, there were there was a, 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 a quite a lot there, but uh, it, it, yes, please. Niels, there is a question in the a couple of questions in the Q and A box, and I think I'll... I can definitely um, speak about the second one, um, and perhaps I can give some inkling about the first, and I'm sure that Morali may want to come into that as well. So the second one is about is saying dementia has taken a staggering blow against Americans, but we never think of this as a global problem. How can we raise awareness of the international? Well, to an extent, you know, um, the COVID-19 has helped us because I think a lot of countries didn't perceive it as a global problem, but it really is. Um, and in particular in the field of research, not just, you know, medical research, but also research into care. There is so much that some countries are doing that can inspire other countries. I mean, look at what South Korea, I can see that we got someone from South Korea here. What South Korea is doing with their dementia plan, which is now in their third iteration, it's incredible. And it's really been inspirational. Um, so we will continue to try and do the international piece, but we do need everybody's help. Um, in, in a way, when we go and speak to the WHO, when we go and speak to the UN, is a global issue. If we discourse about that with one of our national members, obviously we, we focus and, and pinpoint the national uh, point. In the case of India, for example, and this comes back to the first question, which is, it appears the NGO have the most important role in coping with India and with dementia, but what can the government do? Are these challenges best handled by the NGO? No, they aren't. These challenges are best handled by national government. And this is why we at ADI have tried to get a global dementia action plan signed by every single nation in the world, because we think that governments need to take responsibility. Dementia is a massive issue. It doesn't just um, touch health, it touches social care, it touches employment. So there is a lot that can be done. And I can see Niels also want to say something about that. Well, I yeah, I, I just wanted to point just back to India that what is, I mean, it's unfortunate that Mira isn't here because she would be able to really comment on it because of the government. But what strikes me from my time in India was that India is the largest democracy 
and as as a system, it it's it's very complicated to get something done. Uh, whereas in China, I I'm guessing you know they the, the government says they want to do something, it gets done. So uh, it's it's a very complicated situation, and I I w wish. Uh, you know what I would hope with the work that I that I've done with you and Mira and Peter is just trying to kind of uh, make some awareness to the government so that like they, they have the, the 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 I mean artsy has been doing fantastic works work for 30 years but what what the government could do if they gave I mean uh, $100,000 in India is the equivalent of $10 million for an NGO anywhere else. So if the government were able to give a certain amount of money to help uh, the, the people, that would, that would change a great deal. That is so true. I mean, we have um, China, for example, I mean, take China, no? Even in China, where yes, they have the political uh, clout to make it happen, the National Dementia Plan of China, China was approved uh, this year uh, after you know ten years of work uh, on the civil society side. Um, but they can scale it up. That's what can happen. They can scale it up, and they can work on rural areas as well as um, urban. In England, for example, take England, which is a higher income country. We have a great national dementia plan. We are just about to publish a report that says even then we're only 60% effective. And um, in England, you can get decent care in some areas, but in some areas you can't get anything. Um, and but only a government really can scale services up, can have the kind of network uh, that will allow everybody to be served see the, the example of South Korea, even in South Korea, where they've done explicitly that, they still don't have 100% coverage. Uh, I'm seeing something from uh, R. Viragesi. I am a Fulbright specialist and I will be in Kerala in 2022. I am also the chairperson of one of the assisting living facilities in Kerala, I would like to invite you to talk there. Is there a possibility to connect? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, I'll be in touch with, uh, uh, I mean, maybe I'll uh, just send you my email and uh, uh, we can talk from there. Nil, can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah, if I may come online, uh, you all did a beautiful job. You know, I, 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 I wish uh, I am not sure the audience are they all Ful Fulbright scholars or something to, connected with Fulbright, Nils? Uh, my mom's there, so uh, no, no, I mean others. You know, uh, there are there are there are many Fulbright scholars alumni. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, especially the person who is going to India. Uh, I will leave my email here, and you are welcome to connect. And I do have. Three people going to Kerala also in the spring. I was on the selection for Fulbright uh, giving uh, mentoring. You know, I'll be more than glad to advise. And going back to what you are saying with the NGOs in India, you have to keep in mind that the number of NGOs are very limited, and there are a lot of informal network going on. Whoever is going to Fulbright in India or even in other countries uh, with limited resources. It would be a good idea to work with the NGOs to connect with the informal sectors out there. They are like our next door neighbors. They get together and they want to get involved. And again, you know, in a country like India, you need to look at different faith, you know, and they have their own way of looking at this particular thing and also the traditional healers. In a country like the United States, we may not accept the traditional healers, but they are very much part of the local community. So that is something, if you can keep your eyes open, um, Peter and Nils are doing an excellent job in India, you know, and uh, that's only one segment of it. But I think, you know, instead of just putting all your effort into selected NGOs and governmental entities, you know, get to know the community wherever you are. There's a question uh, in terms of the variables of 
diet, family structure, work-life balance, support system, uh, how this impacts on the acceleration and management of, uh, of dementia. And, and the question is, how much of this is measurable? And, and that's a very interesting question, particularly in context. And when it comes to India and most countries that aren't Western uh, or, or high income countries, the ability to, to measure th these, these issues is very limited, especially when it comes to, I mean, quality research that is published in, 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 in good uh, uh, journals. So, I mean, part of what I'm doing right now to go to India and to do this work in, in India, I mean, part of it is that I would like for this, this uh, information to be more available. Uh, and, and for there to be more access to, to, to research uh, on dementia in low and middle income countries. Uh, I mean, India has been doing a good job, so has uh, Costa Rica, uh, but the, the majority of countries uh, are, are, are well behind that. If it does, uh, uh, Paula, if you have a comment or Peter, I'll let Peter go first, given that I've spoken a lot. Yeah. Well, I, 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 the comment I'd like to make uh, is, is really about the collaboration uh, uh, since Mira has been taped. Um, but I also want to comment on um, um, Narendar, who uh, in his role as his executive director um, uh, played a key role in, um, in the partnership uh, artsy, ADI, and uh, and the work that Nils and I did, and um, of, of course we, of course, and Paula spoke beautifully. We acknowledge the fundamental impact that that COVID had. It, it slowed down our effort. It, it, it impacted the capacity of the national office, uh, uh, given funding realities. But what had already been put into place and I salute Mira in her role as chairperson of Artsy, um, was to build a, a, a fundamentally robust relationship with the government, starting with the National Dementia Plan, the model from ADI, that I believe will um, transform the relationship that Artsy has with the government. Um, prior to COVID, the, the government, based on the National Dementia Plan, had agreed um, uh, to fund um, RC uh, chapters to expand their services through what we call dementia-friendly communities. So the partnership was about something far more fundamental than one foundation grant, but it was about um, uh, uh, repositioning the organization and and to build its build its capacity both um, as, as an NGO um, in partnership with private industry and of course um, uh, uh, to finally after many years to engage the government um, through the states in, in funding. So um, the reason I note it as a model for other um, or other Alzheimer's associations is, is that this kind of uh, uh, multi-level um, partnership um, uh, has not gone away, has not gone away and it, and, and it will continue. And, and, I, and I really do believe that the organization um, will um, uh, continue to uh, build, build capacity. So with that, I'll turn it to you, Paula, to, to give a, a more global perspective. So, Niels, repeat me the question again. Uh, uh, the, okay, so the question was basically, how do we measure uh, the, here, let me see, if we, uh, how do we measure the impact 
on the acceleration and management of this disease. And I mean, we're talking about diet, family structure, all the different factors that can be uh, used to uh, to measure this. And is it measurable? Um, I what I said was that in from a from a uh, research standpoint, I think countries like India are very hard to measure. Yeah, well, um, I, I gave some examples in the um, chat line, actually. I wrote a few um, references in the chat. Um, well, it's very difficult to measure. The, at the moment, we can't even talk of prevention. We can talk of risk reduction for factors like diet, etc. Um, because we don't really know for sure that if you do X, the consequence of dementia is going to improve. We don't know whether that person would have developed dementia or not. There is, um, there's been two very good reports that came out in 2019. One was a WHO report, one was a Lancet Commission, and they expanded on our World Alzheimer's report from 2012, where we tackled that issue. Now, what you can measure, however, which is quite interesting, is uh, difficult to measure, but it can be done to an extent because there are longitudinal studies, long-term clinical trials, where you can see the impact of an action on the development of some disease. And so you can see to an extent um, that if you do something like improve your cardiovascular health, for example, uh, keep your brain social um, and do some other actions, which I have described in the chat, uh, where you can find reference to it, um, you can effectively um, delay the onset of a disease. Once again, as I can say, it's not 100% foolproof. There is some big studies being done by the University of Toulouse, the University of uh, Karolinska in Sweden, uh, and also in America, the same study has been run in America, it's been run all over the world. There's a global study called FINGERS that is looking at certain dietary uh, measures that can help people uh, have a later uh, cognitive deterioration. So there is a lot that is happening, but the measurement of that, we are not ready yet. I think uh, for those that are listening to us, one important thing to remember is Alzheimer's and cancer were pretty much discovered at the same time, at the end of the 19th century. However, whilst the equivalent of ADI was founded at the beginning of the 20th century, ADI was founded at the end of the 20th century. And I think this tells you how late our movement has been to, um, uh, and how much we've had to overcome in terms of stigma. So, um, Dementia is still a uh, disease which attracts a huge amount of stigma. And this is what is now affecting us, you know, that we are very late and a lot of this information is not available yet. I, 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 ag I agree with that. And I, I would say a couple things. Um, I think part of the reason, I mean, cancer is a disease that is everywhere, whereas as uh, dementia is a is a a problem of the brain and i i it is my feeling uh that persons who have not experienced a, a traumatic issue with their brain and that I, I and by that i'm referring to not just alzheimer's i'm referring to traumatic brain injuries i'm talking about persons with ptsd or possibly autism these are these are all issues or some types of uh, uh, mental health issues um for a person who doesn't suffer from one of these issues it is very difficult to have a an understanding of what is happening inside the person who is experiencing the problem and i think that that has has caused uh, a significant uh barrier to entry for for the types of of uh research and doctors who do this kind of stuff because i mean i i uh, I mean, I, I talk to neurologists and it to a, a certain degree, they practice a dark art. I mean, they 
they they they see one side of things but they don't necessarily feel it yes and, if i may may i ask lola one question yes okay so lola your 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 association is doing an excellent work and do you happen to have a newsletter where one section of the newsletter could be the evidence based studies typically coming from the western journals like in europe and united states and canada then there is a kind of uh, negating the journals coming out of india and uh, taiwan or china or that kind of a thing where even if it is not par with our uh, western thinking about evidence based study if there is any article would you be kind enough to share with all of us in terms of no i'm talking about is something i want you to think about it in traditional system there are all kinds of ways of doing something about this i am not a medical person you know i am in social entrepreneurship you know but my uh, gut feeling is we may need to educate ourselves about how they were coping with this kind of a thing for long 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 time and even if it is not evidence based so that we get an idea in our mind you know you know that this is very much a, a marketing a community where even pharmaceutical companies say you pop couple of these things you know you'll be all right you know and but there one they can't afford it number two there is something to it the traditional healing practices and i sincerely wish you will look at different countries where they may not have the resources but they do have people who are doing this thing for years and years okay uh, merely we have just a couple more uh I'll, I'll give morally if you don't mind me as a quick reply so morally have you been to one of our conferences because this no, is what no, we no. do no. so we in every panel we try and put together people from all over the globe so from five continents and we give the same space to research and thinking coming from uh, anywhere uh, so Ooh, that's the whole good. point of, of adi really yeah it's, it's the only united states and canada and Yeah. And south south communication for us is precious you know this is very how people good. really trust each other very good and Neil Thanks. sorry for interrupting okay well th this is basically the end of our time and I'll just uh say that uh so th my first fulbright I was doing research on music and dementia care and it went very well and I was able to uh prove prove my hypothesis and now i'm going to be uh doing research with rc on w what we have done with this training center because the what i want to know is having a training center what is the effect because that is what what you, paula paula pointed to is is where do we find the effect and i want to what i would like to know with the training center is when it's there what is the effect for the family members the the trainers and uh the local caregivers so anyway i think this has been a very uh productive talk it's been a little bit wandering if if it's my fault with the slides i apologize and my cat here um but i'd like to thank all of you i would like to thank john bader from the all from the the fulbright association and um i hope to uh, see you all when it happens i mean we're entering a new phase where we get to see each other again and uh so it's just a matter of when so thank you all very very much thank Thank you so much, and the, the thank you to all the panelists for this forum. Um, just wanted to uh, thank all our members and donors who make all our programming possible, and we'll be making this recording available to anyone who were, wasn't able to uh, attend this forum. But thanks so much, and have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.